The last few years has seen a record number of people quitting their jobs, and the number of new businesses that have been started have soared to all-time highs. More and more people are seeing the importance of having a stream of income outside of their job, and they're picking up side hustles and becoming freelancers. Some just want to make a few extra bucks a week for beer money, others want to start their own businesses and quit their full-time job. And as someone who is a serial entrepreneur who has tried just about every side hustle out there, I'm going to be ranking what, in my opinion, are the best and the worst opportunities, with S tier being the best and F tier being the worst. And by the way, this video was a ton of work. So if you appreciate that, go ahead, gently tap the like button and let's get into it. Okay. So the way I'm constructing this is I'm imagining that 1000 people get one month of training in each of these different types of freelancing. Then you check back 10 years later and you look at three different things. First of all, how many of them were successful, AKA how many actually made money, how many of them lost money. And then out of the ones that were successful or weren't successful, how much money did they make or how how much money did they lose? And of course, this is just my opinion. It would be impossible to do an experiment like this, but that's the perspective that I'm coming from when I'm ranking these. I'm also gonna talk about how easy these are, like how much skill does it require, how passive it is, and also how much money you can make from it. So what is the upside? All right, so the first one on the list is going to be delivery apps. So this could be anything from Instacart to Uber Eats, lots of different applications out there where you can make a quick buck by either delivering groceries or moving people from point A to point B. Now, these are extremely easy to get into. It doesn't require much skill and you don't even need a car in some cases. So when it comes to the ease, this one is 10 out of 10, extremely easy. When it comes to how passive it is, yes, you do have to actually spend time, you know, delivering groceries and stuff like that, but you can listen to a podcast while you're doing it. It's not super hard. You don't have to be all that focused. So when it comes to how passive it is, I'm going to say it's about five out of 10. Now, when it comes to the earnings, I'm going to give this one a one out of 10, not good at all. You'll probably earn a minimum wage or maybe slightly slightly above that. It's also not scalable, so there really isn't any upside to this. So for this one, I would say it's great for the average person. Like if you're a college kid who wants to make a little bit extra money, that's awesome. Not so great if you're ambitious. Overall, I do think you would make money with this, so it's not a scam by any means. So I'm going to put it right in the middle in C tier. Next one on the list is going to be Shopify. And I've talked about this one before on my channel. Lots of 16 and 17 year olds on YouTube that are Shopify millionaires and they wanna teach you how you can become one as well. If you've been on YouTube long enough, you have had the absolute pleasure of watching some incredible advertisements like this. 45 seconds, I'm gonna show you how my buddy Justin generates nearly $500,000 per month selling weird stuff like cat socks, fishing t-shirts, and of course, the legendary wolf mug. And Shopify, in a nutshell, is reselling random items that you get in a place like Alibaba. Now, to be successful with this, you do need to be very skilled. It's not easy to do this, but the barrier to entry here is low. You can start doing this with pretty much no money. And if I had to estimate, I would say 99% of people who try Shopify will fail. They either won't make any money or they'll end up losing money. But to be fair, this is a legitimate business. Most businesses fail. At the end of the day, business is a risk. Now, depending on the type of business you get into, usually the failure numbers are somewhere between 70 to 90% in a 10 year period. So that means 70 to 90% of businesses shut down within 10 years. Out of the ones that are left, many of them barely make any money. Now, these numbers are scary and they should be, right? Starting a business is not easy at all, but they're also somewhat misleading because the truth is most people who are successful in business start businesses that they just, for whatever reason, don't don't want to continue with. It's not that they couldn't have made it successful. It's just they realize they don't enjoy it or they find another opportunity that's better. So me and just about every other business owner I know have tried things and failed at them before they found a successful business opportunity. So realistically, I think the success rate of entrepreneurship is probably higher than what it's advertised as. So instead of 99% of them failing, it's probably more like 95% with Shopify, but that's still a lot of people who end up failing. But if you do succeed, there's still still a big problem. Come on, man. It's very easy for others to see what you're doing. There's even software out there that's designed to find these things. And then they can just basically copy your product because at the end of the day, you are a middleman, right? You're just finding a really cheap product that you can buy for, you know, two or three dollars and you're selling it for maybe 15 or $20. That's just an example. And of course, there's more to it than that, but I think you get my point. So usually, even if you are able to find a great product, it's not gonna last long because others are gonna find it as well. It's not like a piece of real estate that's gonna generate semi-passive income for you basically forever. In fact, it's really not going to be passive at all, even though most of the gurus are going to tell you that. That smells like bullshit.
So when it comes to ease, this one is three out of 10, not easy at all. When it comes to how passive it is, three out of 10, not very passive. When it comes to the earnings, you do have a decently high upside here, especially considering the fact that you don't have to risk all that much. So I'll give it a seven out of 10. And when it comes to longevity, this one is three out of 10. Even if you are able to find a successful product, it's probably gonna last for maybe a year or two at the most. Now, is Shopify scalable? kind of i mean you can create multiple shopify stores you can also put many different products on your shopify stores but this is one of those businesses that i think would break at a certain point like if you're managing 20 different shopify stores you're going to start having to hire a team and it's not super scalable like a software company for instance would be so it can be a good choice if you're ambitious but for most people you know if you put like a thousand people through this not very many of them would be successful i would say maybe 50. next one on the list is going to be amazon fba fba stands for fulfillment by Amazon. So this is basically where you own a store on the Amazon platform and you sell products. Now these are physical products and Amazon takes care of like 80% of the hassles of selling physical products for you. So you're basically responsible for doing market research, finding a good product, and then figuring out how to market that product on the platform. This is an example, in my opinion, of an opportunity that was really good at a certain point, but it's not nearly as good as it used to be. This is also one where you're gonna have to invest at least a few thousand dollars in order to get started so when it comes to ease i'm going to give this one a three out of ten not very easy when it comes to how passive it is i'll give it a five out of ten i'd say it's much more passive than shopify but you have to actually find a successful product before it becomes passive when it comes to earning the upside is pretty decent here it's an eight out of ten and when it comes to longevity i'll give it a five out of ten you know the thing is you could find a great product but the problem with that is amazon owns all of your data so they have access to all of your sales data and if they think it's a great product too they can just make their own version of that product have it rank at the top of the page and you are pretty much shit out of luck i expected it to be you know pretty bad but this is really bad and they have actually started to do this with a lot of different products so i would say this is another one that is not good for the average person at all it can be good for you if you are ambitious and i would say that this one is semi-scalable because once you find a successful product it doesn't require all that much maintenance and you can pretty easily hire people out in order to take care of the day-to-day -day stuff next one on the list is going to be etsy and this is basically where you make handmade art and then sell it online so it cannot be manufactured it has to be handmade and i have actually seen a lot of people have success with this the money isn't amazing but this can make a really cool side hustle i mean you're basically getting paid to make art so you're getting paid to do something you probably really enjoy now it's really tough to scale a business like this of course so the ease here i would give it a 7 out of 10 relatively easy especially if you're someone who likes art how passive it is i would give it a 4 out of 10. The the only reason I have it that high is because, you know, if you're making art, you probably enjoy it. So you would just be doing it in your free time anyways. When it comes to earning, I'll give it a six out of 10. Um, I, you don't see people making like millions of dollars a month on Etsy, or if you do, that is extremely rare. But I have seen a significant amount of people who make maybe like a couple thousand dollars a month. And when it comes to longevity, I'll give this one an eight out of 10. I do think that art is something that people have enjoyed for hundreds of years and will enjoy for hundreds of years into the future. So this one, I would say, is good for the average person but just okay if you're ambitious so i'm gonna put etsy in b tier next one on the list is going to be real estate now real estate can be done in so many different ways you can become a real estate professional you can flip houses you can be a real estate agent or you can just be someone who rents out your spare bedroom so this one is basically half side hustle half investing now this one is relatively easy to get into and make good returns but it's very difficult to do well almost everybody will mess up on their first investment investment in one way or another. But space is limited on planet Earth, so houses are always going to be valuable. It's a limited resource, so it has inherent value no matter what. Now, when it comes to ease, I'm going to put this one at 8 out of 10. This is actually the most common side hustle that people have success with. When it comes to how passive it is, it really depends on the type of real estate you're doing. Um, could, depending on what it is, it could be a lot of work, but generally speaking, I'll give it a 5 out of 10. When it comes to earning, you do have pretty high upside here. I'm going to give this one an 8 8 out of 10 and longevity this one gets a 10 out of 10 this is going to be a good side hustle for you to have
have basically your entire life. Real estate has been amazing the last couple hundred years and it's going to be amazing for hundreds of years in the future. Is it scalable? Not really, unless you're Grant Cardone and you buy like thousand unit complexes. I mean, it's possible to make anything scalable if you're really, really good at it, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. So with this one, I would say it's great for the average person and it's also great if you're ambitious because you can make money investing in a duplex, living in one side, renting out the other side, and you basically get to live for free and you might even make a little extra money on the side. So this one definitely goes into S tier. Next one on the list is going to be MLM and this stands for multi-level marketing. Now, a sign of this is when you have to pay to start working somewhere, never pay to apply to a place or pay to start working. That's a really bad sign. The only people who make money in MLMs are the ones at the very top. Everyone else loses money, period. And it's technically legal, but it's borderline unethical. Now, when it comes to how easy it is, I'd say it's like five out of 10. I'd say the only good thing about MLMs is maybe you might learn some business skills that you can use in a different side hustle. Now, when it comes to how passive it is, four out of 10. A lot of the time, you're just going to be badgering people to meet up for coffee and then try to sell them your candles or your life insurance plan. When it comes to the earnings, I'm going to say zero out of 10. Uh, they've done studies on this and I've talked about it in other videos, but something like 99.8% of people who join MLMs end up losing money. It, it's just really, really bad. I would say that usually it's not going to be scalable either, so it doesn't have that upside. And I would say this is horrible for the average person. You're pretty much guaranteed to lose money. And then it's still pretty pretty bad if you're ambitious as well. I mean, if you're ambitious, there's so many other things you could be doing that would be a better use of your time. So MLM is going into F tier. Next one on the list is going to be flipping items. It's another one that I did a lot of when I was a teenager. Very easy to get into. You basically buy and sell things either locally or on Facebook, eBay, Mercari, OfferUp, Craigslist, etc. And you can do this with so many different things. Cars, sneakers, trading cards, collectibles, NFTs. Just kidding. Probably don't do that one. But the ease here, I would say, is 8 out of 10. If it's something that you know a lot about, for instance, cars, if you're someone who has spent a lot of time around cars, you're passionate passionate about it, you work on them, it's really easy to figure out what a good deal is and what a bad deal is. So you can buy a car, maybe work on it a little bit, clean it up, and then flip it and sell it for an extra thousand dollars. When it comes to how passive it is, I would say this one's maybe six out of 10. It is a little bit of extra work, but a lot of people who do this have full-time jobs and just do it on the side. So it's not super passive, but at the same time, it's not too time demanding either. When it comes to how much you can earn, I'll put this one at about seven out of 10. Most of the time, you're probably not going to get rich doing this. I'm sure Sure there's a few exceptions out there but you can make really good money for this and i think it's definitely one of the best side hustles you can do if you still have a full-time job now is it scalable mm, not really because you're the one who has an expertise on a certain thing right so maybe you have an expertise when it comes to cars or pokemon cards it's really hard to hire somebody else out who knows those things as well you'd have to take a very long time in order to train them so this is definitely one of those things that requires a knowledge gap right so you as somebody who knows a lot about sneakers or cars, for instance, you have a much more accurate gauge of what the real market value of one of those things is. And so that's why you're able to buy low and sell high. So I would say this one is great for the average person. Flipping items is amazing. I was a dumb teenager that didn't know anything and I was able to successfully flip items for years. I would put this one as above average if you're ambitious, but realistically, it's tough to scale this one. So your time might be spent better elsewhere. I'm gonna go ahead and put flipping items into A tier. Next one on the list is going to be physical labor. Now, I did a lot of different versions of this when I was a teenager. So for instance, one thing you can do if you own a truck or a van is you can go and help people move items from point A to point B. And you can easily make $50 an hour doing this. Now, work isn't going to be steady, especially at first, but you'll probably make like five times more than you would at a minimum wage job. Detailing cars is another one you can make great money with. Mowing lawns is another good one. Um, I also did demolition. I did construction. I did a little bit of landscaping. Now, an example of physical labor that's a little bit less physical was a sales job where I basically had to move stuff and set stuff up, and then I would sell to people, and then I would break everything down and you know move it back. So there's a ton of different examples out there of jobs that are relatively physical that pay pretty good money. Now, you don't ever want to do jobs like this for minimum wage because it's relatively hard on your body, and this probably isn't something you want to do when you get older. So when it comes to ease, I would say relatively easy to get into. Um, you know, it can 
be pretty intensive. Give it a seven out of 10. When it comes to how passive it is, I would say five out of 10. You know, when I would help people move, for instance, I just put up an ad on Craigslist and I would get a text maybe twice a week. So I would just help them in my free time. When it comes to the earnings, I'll say it's about a six out of 10. Relatively good. I mean, you can earn pretty good money. It's just not stable. It's not steady. And then when it comes to longevity, I would say this one is an eight out of 10. There's always going to be jobs like this unless we invent robots that like drive trucks for us. But the reason I put the longevity at eight out of 10 is because it is pretty tough on your body and it might not be something you want to do for your entire life. But this can be a fantastic side hustle to make extra money, especially when you're young. I would say it is definitely not scalable at all. That's one of the biggest downsides. But this one is great if you're an average person. And I would say it's average to below average if you're ambitious. So overall, this one is going to go into a tier. Next one on the list is going to be what I call a middleman business. So there's a lot of different examples of this. You know, you'll hear about white label businesses, for instance. And an example of this that was successful for a long time, probably not as successful anymore, was there were a lot of white label businesses that would actually design websites. And so you would find the client, you would charge them maybe a thousand dollars, and then you would take all the information that the client gives you, you'd give that to the white label business, they would design the website for you, and then you would present the website to the client. And you can basically use the white label business, for instance, for marketing. So for instance, you can show the client example websites that the white label business has made before. Now, it used to be a heck of a lot more than that. Sometimes people would spend like $5,000 on a website. So this used to be way better back in the day. The margins have definitely shrunk. But that's just one example. There are thousands and thousands of different white label businesses out there. Um, if you want to know about some of them, just type white label businesses into Google. The ease here, I would say, is about seven out of 10. The main skill you need to have is marketing. They take care of almost everything else for you. You just have to market it and then you have to talk to your clients. So you have to communicate with them. When it comes to how passive it is, it really depends on the business. Some of them I've seen are relatively easy for you to hire out. So I'll give this one a four out of 10. When it comes to how much you can earn, pretty good, especially considering the fact that you're not really risking all that much. This is one of those businesses where you don't have to put all that much down. So you could probably get started doing white label for like a hundred bucks. Now, when it comes to longevity, this is where it really suffers because when there is such a huge gap in the marketplace between the service and the client, you know, the service itself may be costing a few hundred dollars, whereas the client is willing to pay thousands of dollars, you know that that gap is eventually going to shrink. And you also know that there's an opportunity there for the white label business or another business to just kick you out because you're kind of an unnecessary middleman. And as markets mature, that tends to be what happens. So the longevity here is two out of 10. Now, is this scalable? I would say somewhat. Again, it depends on which white label business you're tackling. The thing that's going to bog you down the most is communicating with clients. Some clients are an absolute nightmare to communicate with. You basically have to be putting out fires all the time. They'll text you at like three o'clock in the morning. Now I would say this one can be okay if you're an average person. And I'd say it's above average if you're ambitious. This is a relatively good business to start just because of the fact that there's such a low barrier to entry. You don't have to spend that much money in order to get into it. So I'll go ahead and give the middleman business B tier status. Next, I'm going to talk about service based businesses. And specifically, I'm going to be referring to done for you, right? So this is where a client has a problem and you just fix the problem for them. You you yourself come in and fix it. Now, many people actually start off in service-based businesses because it's the easiest to sell. Somebody's got a problem and you're basically like, hey, I'm gonna fix your problem, don't worry about it. But the problem on the entrepreneur side with service-based businesses is your time is very limited. So a lot of people will start off on maybe Fiverr or Upwork, or maybe they even start their own website. They offer a service and then at a certain point, they just don't have enough hours in the day. So they'll move on to a different type of business, which is gonna be coming next. Now, I I cannot tell you how many times I have personally used service-based businesses to help me out. I have probably spent tens of thousands of dollars on Fiverr, for instance. Now, when it comes to the ease, I'm going to put this one as a nine out of 10 because it is relatively easy to get into. The big thing here is just finding a problem that a lot of people have and then offering a service-based solution to that problem. When it comes to how passive it is, I would say three out of 10. Service-based businesses are exhausting. When it comes to how much you can earn, I would say eight out of 10. Some service-based businesses can earn quite a bit of money. And when it comes to longevity, I would say 10 out of 10. People will always need to have their problems solved. This might be the oldest business that's known to time on this list. People have problems and you help them solve those problems with a service-based business. Now, is this business scalable? Usually not. Sometimes you can build out a team that carries out the service for you, but that is a lot easier said than 
and done. There's so many headaches that come along with building a team. This is without a doubt the easiest way to make money if you're brand new, in my opinion. I would say this one is great if you're an average person because you can basically just find a service that's something related to what you're really good at anyways. For instance, if you are an accountant, you could make a service on Fiverr that gives advice to people who are trying to become accountants on college degrees or careers. You could give advice to people who are trying to get into certain companies. You could help them create their resumes to look good. There's just so many different examples of things that you can do based on what you're already good at. This is also great if you're ambitious because as much as people are trying to automate things and create software that's scalable, at the end of the day, it's really nice to just have somebody who's a professional come in and solve your problem for you. So service businesses go into S tier. All right, next on the list is going to be consulting or coaching. And this is what's known as a done with you type business. Now, this is where you have specialized information on a certain problem that people have and you help them to solve that problem. Okay, so something like YouTube, for instance, is general information because you're broadcasting to a wide audience. For instance, I cannot ask you a question right now. This is one way communication. I'm talking at you. When it comes to consulting and coaching, it's two way communication. I'm asking you questions. You're asking me questions because in order to really help somebody, you have to understand the specific situation that they're in. So you ask them questions about their current situation, their goals, their strengths, their weaknesses. Maybe you ask them questions about their interests. And then after learning this specific information about them, you can help them solve their problem and come up with a plan. This is a huge thing that's happening. A lot of people, for instance, are paying for private live streams where they can ask people questions. And this is a shift that I see happening and it's just a huge trend. It also tends to be more tied to the subscription model. So instead of you know spending $1,000 on a course, you might spend $20 a month in order to be able to communicate with someone, ask them questions, and just have a community as well. But at the same time, you can also do one-on-one -on -one consulting. So you might pay someone a couple hundred dollars just to have an hour of their time and ask them tons of questions. I've done this several times with other YouTubers, for instance, where I really like their content and they're just killing it. And so I'll pay them a certain amount of money for me to just ask them questions for an hour. It's definitely hard to scale with the one-on-one -on -one consulting. And that's why you see a lot of people switching into more of a subscription model. So when it comes to the ease, this one I would say is eight out of 10. But again, this is another situation where you would probably be consulting people on something that you're already really good at. Your job is to find problems and then help people solve those problems. When it comes to how passive it is, I would say it's five out of 10. Not super intensive, super difficult, but at the same time, you do have to spend time doing this. When it comes to how much you can earn, I would give this one a nine out of 10. This is actually extremely lucrative. I am seeing people making millions of dollars a year specifically for the private streams. And when it comes to longevity, I think this is a 10 out of 10. In the same way that the written word, aka books, changed the world because it became much easier to learn things because people just wrote down the knowledge that might have taken them their whole life to acquire. Now you can talk to somebody across the globe who is an expert on something that you are trying to learn. So in the past, it might have been incredibly difficult for you to find a mentor on something. And now it's relatively easy. So this is not going to go away. This is huge, especially in the age of information. I would say this one can be good if you're an average person, basically just teaching people things that you're already good at. And I would say it's great if you're ambitious. Next one on the list is going to be e-learning. So this is relatively similar to the last one, but it's more specifically uh, teaching people in the way of selling courses. And there is a lot of scammy stuff going on right now, a lot of fake gurus out there. But with that being said, if you zoom out and look at the bigger picture, uh, again, this is going to change the world. And I think eventually e-learning is going to largely replace universities. They're gonna take a huge cut of the education marketplace. Again, in the same way that books change the game, e-learning is going to change the game as well. It's a super efficient way of efficiently spreading expert knowledge. Again, when I first started YouTube, what did I do? I took several courses on it and that definitely helped me start a successful channel. Now, again, lots of scammy courses out there. There's also some really good ones as well. Now, some really good websites for this would be teachable.com as well as Skillshare. When it comes to ease, I would say it's very difficult to create a course. Um, I spent three months of my life basically creating the College 101 course. It was super difficult difficult. It's basically like writing a book and then you have to film the book. So if you do it the right way, it's really difficult. And to be honest with you, you know, I made some pretty decent money from the course, but I probably would have made much more money if I focused my time on sponsorships or promoting links or something along those lines. So when it comes to ease, I would say this one is a six out of 10. When it comes to how passive it is, once you actually publish the course, it is relatively passive. Once it's out there, it's pretty much on autopilot. I would give it an eight out of 10. Now, when it comes to earning, 
I would give it a 10 out of 10. It's super, super scalable. You can earn a ridiculous amount of money from courses. The specific niche that I did, college degrees, you know, obviously I'm targeting kind of young people who don't have all that much money, especially when you consider the amount of time that I spent on it. But there are lots of courses out there that make way more money than mine does. Longevity, again, I think this one is 10 out of 10 as well. This is the new way to share information and to rapidly learn subjects. It used to be in the past that you would have to find a master, right? You, If you wanted to learn blacksmithing, for instance, you would have to find a blacksmith who was willing to take you on as an apprentice. These days, if you want to learn something from an expert, it's very easily accessible. Now, when it comes to whether this one is scalable, I would say it's incredibly scalable. One of the easiest businesses to scale by far. Now, I will say a lot of people who make courses or the ones that make good courses will start off by doing one-on-one -on -one consultations with people. And during this time, they're going to learn about all the problems that their clients have, and they're going to notice patterns. They're going to see the same problems popping up over and over again. And then they might start doing some group coaching. So doing paid live streams, for instance. And then after working with people for a long period of time, they can release a course where they answer all the questions that they usually get when they work one on one with people. That's exactly what I did, for instance, to release my college 101 course. So this one is OK for an average person. Again, you'd probably want to start off doing either a service based business or consulting one on one. And then after you've done that for a while, then you can move into something like a course. But this one is amazing if you're ambitious. Really, really good one. Now, you do have to be careful. There are a lot of fake gurus out there. Um, I'm not one of those people who thinks like, oh, my God, everyone's out to get me. Um, you know, I check Coffeezilla's channel. He kind of gives you the red flags and the things to look for. But I disagree with him because he seems to think that like every person who sells a course is out to get you. And that's just not true. Next one on the list is going to be penny stock trading. I've talked about this one so many times, like 99.8% of people end up losing money with penny stocks. When it comes to ease, one out of 10, super difficult to be good at penny stock trading. When it comes to how passive it is, two out of 10, you're constantly having to monitor the markets and news, et cetera. You've got like eight screens in front of you. When it comes to how much you can earn, one out of 10, Maybe one out of a thousand people is really good at penny stock trading and they can be consistently successful, but 99% plus of people are going to lose money. Longevity, one out of 10 as well. You know, you might get a little bit lucky and make some money and you should take your profits and leave in that case. Scalable, definitely not. I would say this one is very bad for the average person. Possible if you're ambitious, but super, super difficult. I'm going to put penny stock trading in F tier. Day trading stocks. Similar to penny stock trading, a little bit better. Ease here, two out of 10, super difficult to get really good at day trading. I do think it's possible. I don't think every day trading channel out there is a scam. There are people who are true good at it and can do it over a long period of time but very rare i would say something like if i'm being nice 97 percent of people lose money and that's me being nice when it comes to how passive it is two out of ten not passive at all when it comes to how much you can earn i'll give this one maybe a three out of ten when it comes to longevity again three out of ten most day traders lose money you can look up the stats on this there's tons of statistics that have been peer reviewed and articles that have been published about your chances of success with day trading and it's really bad is it scalable definitely not i would say this is very bad for the average person can be okay if you are exceptional at day trading you're really dedicated to it and you're ambitious. I think one thing is you have to have a certain type of personality to be successful at day trading long term. And if you don't have that type of personality, you're probably not going to be successful. And even if you do, you're still probably not going to be successful, but your chances are going to be slightly higher. So day trading is going to go into D tier. All right. So next type of business that you might hear about is a SaaS business. SaaS stands for software as a service. So this is incredibly useful. You're basically solving people's problems by using software. Software. Now, the ease here, I would say, is two out of 10. Not easy at all. Super competitive, super difficult. Is it passive? Well, at first, it's the opposite of passive. It couldn't be less unpassive. Does that make sense? Yeah, less unpassive. But after you actually create the software and it's successful, it does get relatively passive. So I'll give this one a five out of 10. But again, it could be either one of the extremes. When it comes to earning, this one gets 11 out of 10. It's super scalable, so you can literally earn billions of dollars. This is probably the only one on the list where one single person could create something, maybe get some funding for it, and then end up becoming a billionaire. When it comes to longevity, 
Again, I'm also gonna give this one an 11 out of 10. This one has great longevity. Software is the future. Tech is disrupting basically every industry. Is it scalable? Super scalable. This is the most scalable one on the entire list. Now for the average person, I'm just gonna say it, this one is awful. You probably have a 99% chance of failing. However, if you're exceptionally ambitious, this one is basically S tier. It's God tier status. But it's really hard to label this one because of the fact that it's just so different depending on if you're like an average person versus someone who's really ambitious so overall I'm gonna give this one a tier status all right so I have a little gift for you here I made a freelancing worksheet where I'm basically asking you certain questions that are gonna help you determine which type of side hustle or freelance type job is best for you and these are questions that you want to ask yourself and in some cases you might want to ask other people as well so you can get their input now I'm gonna go ahead and put this at the bottom of the description uh, all you have to do is click file make a copy and take your time on this and answer it thoroughly and then when you look back at this it's going to be relatively easy for you to tell what type of side hustle or freelancing gig is best for you all right last one on the list this is going to be a little bit of a joke but it's going to be influencers right so people like me who make youtube content uh, people who make podcasts instagram influencers etc the ease here i would say is eight out of ten it's relatively easy to start making content now i think most people give up just because it does take some time in order for your content to get seen to get pushed out there and for your channel to get successful so expect to spend at least six months before you make any money at all and I would say a year to two years before you can make a full-time income so most people just simply cannot force themselves to grind through making content for that period of time before they finally catch a lucky break in one of their videos or one of their posts goes viral most people give up because it's really difficult to grind like that for a long period of time when it comes to how passive it is I'd say seven out of ten um, it kind of depends on how you design your channel so for instance a lot of my videos are relatively passive and I get a good amount of my views from search so if I were to stop posting on this channel I still would get a good amount of money every month just from search results but a lot of channels are more news based so they don't get very many of their views from search and in that case it's not passive at all now when it comes to how much you can earn influencers can earn a lot of money it's amazing how much they can earn just go and check out meet Kevin he made over 20 million dollars last year on his channel from selling his course as well as ad revenue etc so influencers can make a good amount of money now for the average influencer I think the best way to make money is doing sponsorships but it really depends on which niche you're in for instance if you're in a niche that serves like really young people merch tends to be pretty good people want to buy your your shirts and your caps and stuff like that but yeah I'd say for most youtubers sponsorships are kind of the way to go but up to this point before recording this video I still have not done a single sponsorship that is how picky I am with what I allow on this channel when it comes to longevity 10 out of 10 influencers are not going to go anywhere anytime soon this is probably going to be a thing for the next thousand years is it scalable Mm, somewhat you can hire out a team to help you make more content and stuff like that but at the end of the day it's one of those things where if you're an expert on something when you hire out a team it's going to be very difficult to have them also be an expert it takes a long time to train them so some parts of it are scalable so I would put it kind of in the mid-range now one great thing about this one is it's super flexible and it can combine with a number of other businesses so you can be a content creator and influencer that also does consulting for instance so I would say this one is great for the average person because you can get paid to talk about something you're passionate about and maybe you make a couple of thousand extra bucks a month on the side it's also great if you're ambitious and again meet Kevin he made like 22 million dollars from YouTube this year that guy is like a freaking energizer bunny if you enjoyed this video check out this one right here I made it just for you go ahead gently tap that like button hit the subscribe button ring the notification bell and comment down below any thoughts comments criticisms etc jab on the video and I will see you next time <laughs>